Lieutenant Hawley, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you both for being here. Admiral, it's good to see you again. Thanks for your time a couple of days ago. I want to start with something that uh, the NDAA from last year says, Section 1247 in particular, it says that it's the policy of the United States to maintain the capacity of the United States to resist a fait accompli that would jeopardize the security of the people on Taiwan. And the NDA also defined that term, fait accompli, to mean the resort to force by the People's Republic of China to invade and seize control of Taiwan before the U.S. can respond effectively. Tell us why it's important for the United States to be able to respond quickly in order to prevent a fait accompli. Uh, thanks, Senator. Uh, certainly where our forces are positioned, again, uh, a number forward, but uh, much in reserve uh, on the West Coast of the United States. Credible combat power placed forward has uh, an extremely valuable deterrent value. A, it can respond with speed. Uh, B, it's operating in the area and can rehearse. Uh, and ultimately, uh, there's no better training than operating in the space you would, you would fight in. And I just want to underline what you said there about the, the necessity for our forces to be postured forward. Combat credible po forces postured forward. That's what will enable us to respond quickly. If I got that right, if I understood your testimony correctly. Yes, sir. Very good. Um, let me ask you this. We recently heard uh, from a RAND analyst, Dave Akmenik, who's written that Taiwan, in his view, ought to prioritize uh, asymmetric defenses like the following. Here's a non-exhaustive list. Smart mines, anti-ship missiles that are deliverable from mobile launchers, mobile short air, uh, short range, rather, air defense missile systems and distributed reconnaissance and, and communication systems. Why, in, in your view, why are asymmetric defenses and uh, capabilities so important for Taiwan to be able to deter a Chinese aggression? Uh, thanks, Senator. Again, a defense in depth mindset and model uh, that can deliver, uh, we've heard many cases, uh, the defense of Taiwan being described as a, a porcupine. Uh, those capabilities allow those effects to be delivered in multiple places at multiple times in multiple ways. So I concur with, uh, with the capabilities articulated. Let me ask you this. You said earlier today that anything that we could do to bolster the defensive capabilities of Taiwan would be desirable. I, I think that's so important. I've introduced my own piece of legislation, the Armed Taiwan Act, which authorizes $3 billion annually to accelerate Taiwan's deployment of asymmetric defenses and conditions that aid on Taiwan increasing defense spending and, and undertaking key defense reforms. Here, here's a broader question for you. We need Taiwan to strengthen its asymmetric defenses in particular as quickly as possible, don't we? Can you, can you tell us why that is? Well, I, I think, Senator, one of the lessons learned as we watch what's going on in Europe uh, is, uh, number one, aggressive nations can take action. So number one, uh, action against the island of Taiwan could happen, lesson one. Uh, lesson two, uh, there needs to be a readiness level as soon as possible. And for that reason, is it fair to say that it is critical for Taiwan to keep increasing its defense spending and to continue to implement defense reforms in order to achieve that sort of porcupine state that you were talking about earlier? Yes. Let's talk a little bit about some of the physical capabilities that you're going to need in PACOM in order to deter China. And I'm thinking of things like attack submarines, carrier strike groups, high-end munitions, air-breathing ISR. The thing about all of these physical capabilities is that they can only be used in one place at one time. Is that, am I right about that? It's fair to say? Uh, I, would, I would say in some cases, there are certain domains uh, that capabilities could be brought to bear very quickly uh, and when I think about space and cyber. Right, gotcha. But leaving aside space and cyber and thinking about just the, the physical capabilities, these are sometimes called the high demand, low density assets that if they get used in one theater, let's say UCOM, then they're not available in PACOM. And, and so there, there's a trade off. Have I got that right? I mean, we've got to make choices. Uh, again, depending on the types, right? So bombers can move quickly, and we in many cases share those in the same mission across multiple combatant commands, but most uh, at the speed that they can move uh, can only serve us one at a time. Fair enough. Where I'm going with this is something you and I have already talked about, which is that while we have a current crisis in UCOM, I think as we think about 
the ongoing challenges that we face in PACOM, both in the short and in the long term, I want to make sure that DOD is not taking capabilities from your theater that we've absolutely got to have to continue to deter China through a strategy of denial and using them in other theaters, unless, of course, they're backfilling in some way. So uh, if you want to comment on that, go ahead. If you don't mind, Senator, uh, again, I just want to be very clear that, that nothing, uh, the Secretary has not removed anything that he's allocated to me at this point uh, to a different theater. Very good. If I could, just one more question, Mr. Chairman, and, and it's about uh, the Admiral's upcoming 1242 report. Just give us a sense, Admiral, uh, and as we anticipate that report, and without commenting on the specifics yet because it's not out, but how important will it be for Congress to fully fund the requirements that you have listed in that report uh, in order to do your job of deterrence in, in PACOM? Uh, sir, I think what I would say is, you know, the committee and the Congress has tasked me to provide those requirements. I think I'd leave the legislations and the legislating up to, to this team. Uh, what I would do is just thank you for your focus on the Indo-Pacific Command, and I look forward to being able to deliver you those requirements.